Good afternoon. So how are you guys doing? Brittany, and I think I saw one other student. Was there someone else there? So, oh, that's right. I, don't, I know there's a Brittany that can't respond because she's in a public place. Okay. So anyway, so welcome to the week two instructor session. So today's lesson, I'm going to go over the week three quiz. Now, you don't have to take your week three quiz until next week. Also, you don't have to do your week three forum until next week. This week, we're in the week, we're in week two. And so the only thing due this week is your week two pre-writing outline. And so on Sunday, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna fill out the worksheet and you're gonna write an outline of your paper. You're gonna write a thesis statement with three reasons. And then these three reasons become the outline of your paper. So for example, here's a very simple one. So if I wanna say, I became a teacher because I love my students. I love teaching my students new skills and I love learning about students from different backgrounds. Then that would be my thesis statement. In other words, it's a main idea, uh, main sentence. Then um, paragraph one would be, I love teaching my students new skills. I love learning about their backgrounds and I love uh, whatever the third reason was. So whatever my three reasons in my thesis statement then become the topic of my uh, background, of my um, body paragraphs. Now, if you can't think of a thesis statement, let's say you're stuck, you can write your three uh, body paragraphs first. Then you would summarize the content of the three of your three paragraphs into your one sentence thesis statement that you're gonna place as the last sentence of the first paragraph. And you're gonna uh, place this main idea sentence known as a thesis also as the first sentence of your last paragraph. So, and you're gonna do all of that in the week four rough draft. So right now you just write an outline pre-writing. So remember that the writing process has three different stages. It has pre-writing in which you write the outline of your paper. Then it's writing where you transform the outline into a five paragraph essay format. Rewriting where you correct any mistakes in your essay. So remember the three stages of the writing process is um, pre-writing, writing, rewriting. Writing. And so the week two assignment is pre-writing. It's the first stage of the writing process. And in that stage, which is what we're doing this week, you're simply going to write an outline in which you write your thesis statement, then you write your three reasons, your three topic sentences, and then the subtopics of what your outline is going to be. And so in this pre-writing stage, you're trying to decide what am I going to write about for my essay? What will be my reasons? What will be my story? What points am I going to use to um, justify, illustrate, uh, describe my main idea? Remember, whenever you make a claim, let's say the most embarrassing day of my life was when um, my pants tore, then, you would, then that would be your main idea. And then you would have to back it up with why this was embarrassing. So then you have three different points, which usually three different life lessons. I learned that day that humility, gratefulness, and kindness. Humility, because everybody makes mistakes. Like the day you're, you, you try to do exercise and your pants split. So you learn humility. You learn gratefulness. Nobody laughed at you. And you learn kindness so that when somebody else makes a mistake, you're not going to laugh at them. So there you got your three different uh, reasons. And therefore, that becomes your three different body paragraphs. Humility would be one paragraph. Gratefulness, nobody laughed, would be the next paragraph. And kindness would be the lesson learned. Most importantly, when somebody else makes, makes a mistake, I'm not going to laugh at them. Then you have your conclusion. So that would be your five paragraph narrative essay with a moral. So what I did was I combined, because actually you have two different kinds of essays, narrative essays. There's a narrative essay with a moral, and there's an, a narrative essay in which you make a claim with three reasons. So those are the two different kinds of essays. 
if you go to the home page, I will have a, uh, you will have this whole narrative essay, this lecture notes, this session, as well as a PowerPoint that I created called What is a Narrative Essay? So when I go to say, um, let's say I'm going to share my screen briefly. So if I go to Zoom, okay, and I share, and I go to uh, dashboard, where is the dashboard? That's nice, no dashboard. Well, anyway, normally I would go to my dashboard and then it would have um, what I'm looking for. And it's not there. Okay, so anyway, go to my home class homepage and then on the class homepage, you will see um, my lecture notes. I thought I had it up. Okay, I don't. Anyway, so basically what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to my, um, we're going to do the week two instructor session. And we are going to go over these four things. We're going to do the week three prep quiz. We're going to do the week two assignment prep, which is what I was doing just now, in which I was talking about how you write an outline for your paper. So for this week, week two instructor and week two um, assignment, uh, all you have to do is write an outline of your paper. And then you would do free writing. So I'm going to show you an example of a worksheet that you can do. Then I'm going to go over your week three quiz prep and week three forum, which are both for next week. So that's going to be the sum total of what I'm going to talk about for today's lecture. So before you take your week three quiz next week, you should study and watch this recording. Then make sure you can score a 100% on the practice quiz before you take the week three quiz, just like you did for the week one quiz. And so I'm very proud of what all of you have done. Most of you did really, really well. And here is the prep for the week three quiz. So the week three quiz is gonna go over parts of speech. In other words, what is an adjective? What is an adverb? An adjective modifies a noun. A noun, as I mentioned last week, is a person, place, or thing. A verb is an action or a state. An adverb modifies a verb. Words ending in ly are adverbs. John rode his horse slowly. Slowly is an adverb that modifies the verb rode. Rodney drove his car too rapidly. Rapidly is an adverb that modifies the verb drive. Adverbs can be anywhere in the sentence. You can say rapidly, Rodney drove his car. Rodney rapidly drove his car. Rodney drove his car rapidly. An adjective modifies a noun and comes before the noun. However, adjectives are usually before the noun except for some cases. Okay, so I'll show you the exceptions. John is a writer slow. Now this may be correct in Spanish and French, but in English, you cannot say Rodney is driver fast. So you have to say uh, John is a slow writer and Rodney is a fast driver. And so we have several students in this class who speak other languages who may not know that. Okay, so Brianna is a slow writer. So slow is an adjective that modifies the noun writer. Tanjika is a fast driver. Fast modifies the noun driver. Adjectives can come after the noun, uh, after the noun, after the verb to be. So if I say something like John is tall, uh, Robert is, Jasmine is smart. And so here, Jasmine is smart. And so smart is coming after the noun. And this only occurs when you have the verb to be. And so that's, or are, is, are, were. Any Jasmine was smart. Well, that would mean that Jasmine's passed away. Okay. So here you have Imani is tall. And so tall would uh, modify the noun Imani. So here you would say the handsome or the handsomely man dresses handsome or handsomely in a fancy suit. And so here we always know that a verb that 
that a word that ends in ly means that it's an adverb. And so here, an adverb modifies the verb. It doesn't modify the word man. And so therefore, the answer to this one is the handsome man dresses handsomely. Because here, handsomely, the adverb is modifying the verb how he's dressing. Is he dressing in a sloppy manner or is he dressing in a handsomely manner? So here you would say the handsome man dresses handsomely in a fancy suit. So this sentence illustrates how the adjective usually comes before the noun and the adverb usually comes after the verb, usually. Although, like I said before, adverbs can come anywhere in the sentence. You can say handsomely, the man dresses in a fancy suit. The handsomely handsome man dresses in a fancy suit. So anyway, so that's why that handsomely can come anywhere in the sentence. But anyway, so you, you know that, but normally, usually, uh, ly always indicates an adverb, and therefore an adverb always modifies a verb. That's important to remember for your quiz. I was paid handsome or handsomely for my job. Brittany, can you, can you speak or not? Can you unmute? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. So here, is it I was paid handsome or handsomely for my job? Handsomely. Handsomely. Because handsomely, why, why is it handsomely? Although I wrote it down here. Handsomely is an um, Oh, go ahead. Um, it's a, an adverb. That modifies job or paid? Does it modify a verb or a noun? So the verb. Right. So what is the verb in this sentence? Mm. Remember, Can you repeat the sentence? I was paid handsome, oh, handsomely for my job. Uh, paid. Paid is the correct answer. Are you able to see the, uh, the presentation? Um, where is it located? Right here. So are you able to see this presentation? No, ma'am. Um, what I'm seeing is the uh, internet browser with Zoom. Oh, since you are screen, screen sharing and it says that, uh, um, hold on. Well, yeah. Yeah, there. I see your. All I see is your face now. Okay, and now uh, if I go like this and this, can you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am. I can see it now. Oh, okay. I'm glad I asked because I should. Do you want me to go over it over again? We didn't do very much, so luckily I caught that early. So now yes, you can. See. That would help. Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. So no, let's okay. Do, let's do this again. Okay, that's good for the recording too. So. Today we're doing the week three quiz. And so um, we're going to be doing parts of speech. So here are the parts of speech in English. You have the adjective, which modifies a noun. Noun is a person, place, or thing. A verb is an action or state. An adverb modifies a verb. Words ending in ly are adverbs. John rode his horse slowly. Slowly is an adverb that modifies the verb road. Rodney drove his car too rapidly. Rapidly is an adverb that modifies the verb drive. Adverbs can be anywhere in the sentence. Rapidly, Rodney drove his car. Rodney rapidly drove his car. Rodney drove his car rapidly. So adjectives modify a noun and Adjectives usually come before the noun. However, adjectives are usually, and I just say that for the noun. Yeah, so when you say John is writer slow, that's incorrect in English. Rodney is driver fast, that's incorrect in English. However, this is correct in Spanish. In, in English, we would say Brianna is a slow writer and slow becomes the adjective that modifies writer. Tanjika is a fast driver 
fast is the adjective that modifies driver. However, adjective can come after the noun if you have is. Jasmine is smart. Smart is an adjective that modifies the noun jasmine. Imani is tall. And so tall is an adjective that modifies the noun um, Imani. In this sentence, the handsome man, here you have the adjective handsome, dresses handsomely, in which this modifies the verb, dresses in a fancy suit. So the handsome man dresses handsomely in a fancy suit. I was paid handsomely for my job. Handsomely is an adverb that modifies how well I was paid. Now that you can see the presentation, this makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Yeah, so Jaden yes. snored loudly. Is loudly an adjective or adverb? That would be similar to your uh, you know, verb uh, quiz, quiz question. Would it be an adjective or an adverb, loudly? Adjective. It, most words that end in L-Y tend to be, are, are adverbs. An adverb. Yes, it, oh, that's, that's an easy thing to remember. As soon as you see L-Y, you know instantly it's an adverb. So that's, that's an easy giveaway for adverbs. Now there are two kinds of pronouns. You have an object pronoun and you have a subject pronoun. And so an object pronoun is a pronoun that comes after, um, is a pronoun used as an object. And it replaces, another, both, both subject and object pronouns replaces, replace another noun. And the noun that's replaced is called an antecedent. That's missing, oh well. So object pronouns are located after the verb. Us, him, her, them, you, me, it. So these are all used as objects after the verb. John gave me money. He gave money to me are all the same. You can say, John gave me money, he gave me money, or he gave money to me. And so here you cannot say, John gave I money. So you have to use, so you gotta memorize, because on the quiz, they're, they're gonna say, which is the object pronoun in this sentence? And then they, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna underline it, and you're gonna have to know that they're referring to me, okay? So you gotta know us, him, her. There are a lot of people who say, John gave I money. Or, or my friend and me went to the store when it's supposed to be my friend and I went to the store. Because subject pronouns, while object pronouns are located after the verb, subject pronouns are located before the verb. I, he, she, they, we, you, it are all subject pronouns because these pronouns replace the subject of the sentence, they replace the noun subject, and then these pronouns replace the noun, uh, like John gave uh, Mary money. So if I'm gonna, uh, John gave Yvonne money, so, so that would be me. So I'm gonna replace that with, instead of saying Yvonne, I would say me. And therefore here you have an object pronoun. Who are you giving it to? You're giving it to a person. So therefore it is the object of the verb. That's why this is known as an object pronoun. And so you gotta memorize this. And then you can't say, she, me is a good, great dancer. You have to say, I am a great dancer. Or you can't say, us is a great dancer. Although I have family in Texas who do talk like that. You have to say, they are a great, they are great dancers. Because when you, when you have a pronoun before the verb, you use the subject pronoun, he, she, they, we, on, it. She gave us money. Is she an object or subject pronoun? Brittany, is she subject. an object, subject pronoun? And so she gave, what about us? Is us an object or subject pronoun? Uh, object? Yeah, that's right, I, I wrote it right there, yeah. The apples spoiled due to the humid weather. What pronoun would replace apples? Would it be they or us? Or we? So what pronoun, what, what, what I replace this with is the apple. So if I want to, what pronoun would replace apple? Would, first of all, would it be a subject pronoun or an object pronoun if we're going to replace apples? A uh, subject. Okay. Which of the subject pronouns are we going to replace apples with? Remember that it's plural. Um, they, we. 
Yeah, they would not, not we, we would be for people, but if it's going to be okay. objects, they spoiled due to the humid weather. Yes, this is mm -hmm. an actual quiz question. So remember that pronouns replace nouns and apple is the subject of the sentence. So it is replaced by a subject pronoun. And because it's an object, it becomes, um, well, that's like they, we don't use we. Anyway, Jaden sent Brianna on an uh, errand. What pronoun would replace Brianna? Do we say she or her? Her. Her, because her is an object pronoun that comes after the verb. So Jaden sent her on an errand. And because Brianna is after the verb, we use her. If I'm going to replace Jaden, who's a guy, do I use he or him? He. He sent her on an errand, correct. So if I replace all of them, it becomes he sent her on an errand. So that's that's it for subject and object pronouns. You got that clear? Is that good? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the next one is possessive pronouns. A possessive pronoun shows that someone possesses something or it belongs to someone. And we do not use apostrophe S with possessive pronouns. Um, that's a different kind of pronoun. And so here you, you have his, hers, theirs, ours, yours, its, mine, my, his, her, their, your, its. However, if I'm going to use someone's name, John's book. So if I'm using somebody's name, then I can use apostrophe S. But if I'm not using somebody's name, if I'm not uh, saying that it's, uh, the, you know, then you don't have to use apostrophe S. The dog wag, because it's a pronoun. If we're, if we're just talking about any kind of possession, like, like John's dog, that's not a pronoun. That's just a possessive adjective. So here you have a possessive pronoun in which you have to replace uh, the noun with a pronoun. So that's why you're replacing the noun um, John with my, or John, become, actually John becomes his. Um, and then Susan's book becomes her book. John and Mary's book becomes their book. And then um, Brittany's book becomes your book. And, and Professor H's book becomes my book. And so here we're replacing the names, just like what pronouns do, with, or the names and it's the antecedents with a pronoun. So that's why they're known as possessive pronouns. And so people think that you got to put an apostrophe S there. Actually, if you put an apostrophe S, that becomes it is. It's a nice day. So that's incorrect. So you have to say the dog wag its tail. The book is theirs. There's no such, theirs actually would mean there is. And then we don't use this kind of there for there is anyway, because when you use apostrophe S, you use it to denote some belongs to someone as in someone's name, John, Mary, uh, Donald or something, but you don't put apostrophe S after a possessive pronoun, basically. So that is a common mistake. Instead, with a possessive pronoun, there is no S, there is no apostrophe. So that's going to be on your quiz. They're going to say, which is correct? Let me see if I can do this. They're going to have this. They're going to have something like Okay, where's the error? And which one is correct? Is it the first one or the second one? You know, and so you would know that it's the second one. There's the ones without the the one without the uh, uh, apostrophe s. And so that's the so this one makes it wrong. And this one makes it let's see like this. Correct. The book is theirs. Kayla's neighbor is blind. This is his book. So that means Kayla's neighbor. John is blind. This is his book. This book is his. And so when you just write, when you just write it independently, when you write a possessive pronoun alone, you then you would write this is, book is his. Then it comes as an independent after the sentence. And that way you don't have to write more. The dog wag its its tail. And so you don't write its, we just have ITS. My car lost its its rear license plate. And once again, you just use its and not the contraction its. This book is yours. So we don't have the apostrophe yet s, it just becomes yours. And so here, um, the mayor said the task of cutting the budget 
was not hers, hers, hers. And it becomes hers. You don't put the apostrophe after, you don't put the apostrophe in between. The, this book of his and his is boring. And he is becomes, no, he's becomes, um, he is, it becomes a contraction. So we don't put it over here. The book of his is boring. Or you could say his book is boring. There is a pronoun. Oh, this car is theirs. And so you cannot have, it would be wrong to say something like, I don't know if I did this already, um, or if I'm repeating it. There, well, this car is, this car is theirs. Oh my gosh, I just did that, didn't I? Oh, boy, am I getting, yeah, because I wrote, I just wrote down here, is this correct or incorrect? This car is theirs. And of course, this gives it away. On the quiz, you're not going to have this little squiggly red line. But anyway, um, but when you're doing your essay and you have your grammar check on, if you see a little red line in your essay, that means that you made a mistake. That's why it's good to have grammar check on in your Microsoft Word. That's a totally different topic. But So this is incorrect, and this is correct because there's no apostrophe S. There is a car in the garage. Their car is red. You cannot say there is a car in the garage, there's a car in the garage, or this car is theirs. Okay, so uh, theirs. Why are these wrong? What is the correct, how, how would I correct it? Although I think I got one of them. Why isn't the first one wrong? Brittany, how would I? Um, it's, the, it's the wrong there. It should be T-H-E-R-E. -E. Yes, that's correct. Why is, why is this one has two mistakes? It just adds on to it. What? Um, same thing, except um, there should be no apostrophe. Oh, actually, you could have the apostrophe in this Oh, one. yes, yes. There's oh, yeah, a car in the garage. In this case, because here you have there is. So in this case, okay. actually, I'm wrong. Actually, there's only one mistake one. in this sentence is that it's not the right there. This car is theirs. How would I correct this? Um, uh, T H E I R S. Yeah, so correct would be this car is theirs. Correct. And so here, he's, she's, it's, theirs, your, and their are all contractions. Did you learn this in first grade or second grade? Or third grade, which do you I remember? I, do, I don't remember. Actually, this, um, I, I'm not sure that I truly learned it altogether. I've not been a very good student in English. <laughs> oh, OK. I remember learning this in like second grade. Um, the teacher made flash car flashcards and made it a game. Made us all stand up. She's green. She's wearing a, 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 a big, you know, in other words, she, she used us as her uh, flashcards. I remember she, we had to, to come up with, and John's a good student. We had to come up with compliments to each other and find something positive to say. We actually found it as kids easier to make fun of each other. John's stupid or John's, <laughs> John's nose is too small. And then at first everybody was insulting each other when we were doing the, the, the game. And then she goes, I'm gonna make the game harder. You actually have to find something nice to say about each other. And he, she was right. It was harder to find nice things to say. So we were really, really dumb second graders. But hey, I guess that's the fun of teaching little kids. OK, demonstrative pronouns tell you when something, when an object is close to you or far away from you. So if the object is close to you, you would say this book. If it's a singular object that's close to you. If the object is far away from you, when it, you say demonstrative, it means that you're pointing at something going, this book, that book. And so that's, that means you're demonstrating to the person where something is. Or if you're teaching a language, you would say, this is a table. This table is um, red. That table is yellow. And so you're pointing out. So that's why demonstrating. That's why it's called a demonstrative pronoun. And so this book is near. When something is near you, you say this. When something is far away, it's that. When something is far away, but there's a lot of them, those books, and if something is close to you, it becomes these books. So it's close to you. 
And now correction is, do we say, we don't say this their house is old. We have to say this house is old. We don't say that their beer is stale. We say that beer is stale. We don't say them shoes are smelly. We don't also say them their shoes are smelly. And then we end up talking like my, my relatives in the South in, my, in Texas. And so we would say, so this is on your quiz. So correct would be these shoes are smelly. If it's, if the shoes are located close to you. If the shoes are far away, you would say those shoes are smelly. Or even if you want to replace the whole shoes with a pronoun, a subject pronoun, then it becomes they are smelly. So does, so is this clear? Everything good? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so a comparative. A comparative is when you're comparing only two things, not three things, four things, then you would use a superlative. So when we're comparing two things, we say smaller than, taller than, uh, bigger than. So we would say Kayla is smarter than Jaden. Destiny is taller than Steve. We don't say more better. That does not exist in English. And so here, when you have words that have one syllable, then you tend to say smaller, taller. And then when something has, when the word or the adjective has more than one syllable, then you would use, he is a better learner than I am. Then you can use better or worse, okay? So, John, but we don't say destiny is more better at math than Steve. You would say destiny is better at math than Steve. You don't say destiny is less better at math than Steve. You would say that destiny is not as good at math as Steve. Okay, so here, um, Tanjika is more intelligent than Brianna. So there's more than, um, when you have more than one syllable, you don't say uh, Tanjika is intelligenter than Steve. That is a common mistake. And some, some people will actually talk like that and say intelligenter, thinking that, well, if I can say taller than, why can't I say intelligenter than? This is more of an ESL mistake, as in foreign students make this kind of mistake. Um, native speakers uh, can tell instant, well, most native speakers can tell instantly that doesn't sound right. Okay, does that sound right? Jaitanjika is intelligenter than Brianna? Uh, no, ma'am. See, as a native speakers can usually pick that up, but for um, foreigners, if they see it taller than, then it would think, well, why can't we do it like this, right? It makes sense that if you're, you know, you just simply um, figure that if you could do it here. So notice, intelligent has four syllables. As soon as the word has four syllables, then we start using more than, less than. Do you remember learning this in about, this I remember learning in second grade. Everything about syllables was second grade. Do you remember that? Um, a little bit. And I remember the teacher would clap it out too. You got to keep it interesting because we're little kids. Everything has to be a game. Otherwise, the kids would just run around wild, which is what it was like at our school. Tanjika, and can you imagine, tr that's trying to do it face to face, trying to keep our attention. Can you imagine trying to keep the attention of a second grader online? I wouldn't want to be the teacher who had to teach a second grade class online. I mean, it's hard enough to keep them interested face to face, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so those, all those teachers who taught during the pandemic, they're, they're heroes too. Can you imagine? Tanjika is more intelligent than Brianna. So right here, we are just talking about Tanjika and Brianna. We're not talking about anybody else. So that's what we call a comparative. So comparing two things. Leela is less intelligent than Debbie. Here we're comparing two pictures. Okay, the stranger or strangess of the two pictures featured an owl with three eyes. So if we're just comparing two pictures. Do we use EST or do we use ER? And this is one syllable. Uh, ER. Yes, so we say the stranger of the two pictures featured an owl with three eyes. When you have a superlative, you're comparing more than two things. Like you would say, the Eiffel Tower is the tallest uh, or most beautiful uh, bill, uh, monument in the world. Beautiful. So once you get more than one syllable, it becomes M-O-S-T. 
or most or least, okay, most beautiful, least beautiful in the world. In other words, more than one, uh, more than two people. And so it suddenly everything becomes O S T E A S T. If it's one syllable, John is the tallest student in the entire class. You're comparing John to everybody in the class. Therefore, if it's one syllable, you don't need more and less. You don't say more. You would say tall, tallest. You don't say more tallest. Okay. So you cannot say John is more tallest uh, or most tallest in the class. So just tallest. So one syllable, you just add the EST. And then if it's more than one syllable, you can add most, um, least, that sort of thing. So uh, Imani is the least intelligent student in the class. So intelligent. And so four syllables. And here you don't say more or less. So Imani is the least intelligent student in the school. Kayla is the most intelligent student in the school. Jasmine is the dumbest student in the class. So here you have only one syllable. You just add EST. And then it's more than uh, more than two people, then you add, you don't say dumber. Okay? You don't say Chasmin is the dumber student in the class. That doesn't even sound right. For As a native speaker, that should not sound right. So that's how you can, for a native speaker, you could just sound it out. Um, ESL students have to just memorize the rule. They don't have that natural, unless they've been in the United States for many, many, many years, then they too can acquire the native, um, the ability to sound it out. But that requires many years of being in this country. So if you've been many years in whatever country, you can become almost like a native speaker. Do you speak any other languages, Brittany? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh, well, have you ever thought of learning another language? Possibly. If I have the time, maybe one day. Which language would that be? Probably Spanish, just because it would be the most beneficial in this country. Yeah, in Spanish is el más inteligente estudiante en la escuela. And then uh, all the now now at this point, all the Spanish speaking students who are listening to this lecture can now break out in laughter and go, oh my God, she's speaking Spanish with such a heavy American accent. People laugh at accents, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's ah, ha, ha, ha. oh, okay. She's the English teacher. Okay. We can't laugh at the teacher. We gotta <laughs> behave ourselves. That sort of thing. So I, I just gave somebody, a Spanish speaker, a laugh. Anyway, so they have the same thing in, in Spanish. Now, going on to antecedent. So we're done with superlative. So the difference between a comparative and a superlative is comparative deals with two things, smarter than, taller than, more or less, while a superlative is more than one thing, and you have est, est, and then it, least, and most. So everything ends in a T. That's, that's what's easy to remember about, um, about superlatives. An antecedent. An antecedent is what the pronoun replaces. In other words, the noun that the pronoun replaces is the antecedent. So if I say John, John is the antecedent, and then pronoun he is uh, smart. Uh, Sheila is the antecedent, and she is ugly. And so John and Sheila are antecedents, and therefore you're, you'll you notice that when I say John, I said he. Therefore, that the antecedent has to agree in number and gender. Okay, so if I say John and Mary, they are whatever. So therefore, the antecedent and the pronoun has to agree in both gender and number. And so here I give some examples. Jaden is a smart man. He reads every day. So here you're agreeing in gender and number because it's only one person and if he's a guy. Here you have two, um, two, two, two people and here you, you don't you just say they. In other languages you also have to agree in gender but you don't have to worry about that in English. In English you just have to agree here in number. So in this example you're agreeing in gender and in this example, you're agreeing in number. So therefore, if I have on your quiz, true or false, um, antecedents agree in number and gender. Is that true or false? Brittany, is that true? True, true. yes, it's, it's uh, gender and number. 
I should write that down some, somewhere, didn't they? Not, okay, after a comparative, you have a subject pronoun. And so remember that a comparative means that you're comparing two things. So here, you don't say, so here, what is a subject pronoun? Is it I or me? Which one is the subject pronoun? I. I. So the correct answer is, um, Veli plays better piano than I. This is actually a common mistake, even among native speakers. I do hear people say, Veli plays better piano than me. And even when I say it, doesn't that sound right to you? Sadly? Yes, yes it does. So therefore, um, then, then if you want it to be formal, but most British, that's the difference between British and American English. British, most British um, people have much better grammar uh, than Americans, than Americans. They don't, British people don't make this mistake. But Americans, oh yeah. The reason why this is, is Belly plays better piano than I do. And so normally in common speech, do is understood and deleted. Therefore, the correct one is Veli plays better piano than I. So that is why, okay, that is that was originally in English. This was the original sentence. And then as English became more and more colloquial and through time, people got rid of do because they got too lazy to say the do. And therefore it became Veli plays better piano than I. But because most people are used to me, uh, object pronouns coming after the verb, then, then I morphed into me, you see. That was where that mistake came from. And in linguistics, there's actually a name for that, which I won't bother. You don't have to know that. But there is, this is very what I'm talking about is very linguistics. And that was my major in college. So that's how come I know all of this. Then here you have to agree in gender. Leela plays worse golf than Lamont and Sierra. So here you would say Lolita plays worse golf than they do. Okay, so here do, and then do is usually um, knocked out. And so here you would, you would say Lolita plays worse golf than they. See, it doesn't sound right because a lot of people just say them, right? Lola plays worse mm, golf yes. than them, but it's actually they. So this is why we have to teach it at, in this quiz because it is such a common mistake even among um, native speakers. Um, Thelma plays worse golf than them. So this is not correct. It's supposed to be Thelma plays worse golf than they. Your piano performance proved you practiced more than they did. See, oh, instead of did, we take out the did and it becomes more than they. So your piano performance proved you practiced more than they did or they. And so they is a subject pronoun because it isn't, it is a subject of did. All right. So are you ready for the, uh, are you ready for the quiz, uh, quiz three practice quiz? So if you can score a 100% on this practice quiz, you are ready to take the actual quiz three. So let's, let's try it out. Um, your piano performance proved that you practiced more than they. Is the pronoun in this sentence an object or subject pronoun? Subject. A, correct. We could not have asked for a better or more better teacher. A. Better teacher, excellent. Which of the following is true about pronoun antecedent agreement? A, B, or C? B. B. William took his class blank and studied several hours a day. Which adjective complete or adverb completes the sentence? B. B. By the way, I hear a lot of people talking like A, okay? On TV, I actually hear people saying, William took his class very serious. I, I hear that among native. Do you? It actually, because of the fact it sounds right, means I, I hear a lot of people making that mistake. So William took his class very seriously. And also whenever you see very, that's a, an indicator that an adverb is about to occur, okay? L-Y. So that's a big fat clue. The clothes that, Le that Laura gave my sister and me were too small. Is the pronoun in this sentence an object or a subject pronoun? Um, object? 
Correct, yes. Because here you have the verb and then me is the object pronoun. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, so number six, do we say uh, them two movies are about life in early New England? Or do we say those two movies are about life in early New England? Those? Those. And by the way, this should go like, oh, okay. No, I wanted to make move this to the next one. Yeah, without creating, hold on, without creating that. Okay, it's not working. As the little boy, uh, something snuggled the tiny kitten, the kitten purred. Which adjective or adverb completes the sentence? Gentle or gently? B. B, gently snuggled, because here we talk about how he snuggled the kitten. Okay, if we want to use gentle, where would we put it in the sentence? Um, where does an adjective usually go in English? Uh, you would put it uh, as the little boy. Before the little boy, yes. As the gentle, yeah. as the gentle little boy gently snuggled the tiny kitten, the kitten purr. So if you're going to use gentle, it always goes before the noun. So it's not to confuse the audience. The correct answer to seven is B, gently, okay? As the little boy gently snuggled the tiny kitten, the kitten purr. So here you have an adverb. Tara told most clever jokes or more clever jokes I've ever heard. You gotta remember, are we comparing two people or are we comparing more than two people? Is it a, is it a superlative or is it a comparative? Because of comparative, we only do two people and superlative, everybody. So which one is it? What, would it be A? Yes, correct. Because superlative means that this, so many jokes. I'm not just talking about two jokes. I'm talking about all the jokes in the world. Okay, so Tara told the most clever and also the, as soon as you see the, you know it's a superlative. He's, he's the funniest person in the room. He's the tallest student in the class. So as soon as you see the, and the is used as emphasis. When you teach foreign students when to use a definite article, the, it emphasizes the, uh, how tall something is. It emphasizes just how clever that person is. So Tara told the most clever um, jokes I've ever heard. So they're, therefore, A, most clever, uh, superlative. Okay, so is it that dog or that their dog? For number nine. That dog. A. That dog. And also because I said it with an accent, because that's how my, my relatives, when they say, Jack entered that their dog in an obedient contest, yeah, yeah, I can, I can do the accent because that's how they talk. And they speak Chinese that way too. And that accent does not exist in China. They, they have their own <laughs> Southern Texan accent on their Chinese as well. It's just so funny. What part of speech is there? Is there a noun, adjective, or pronoun? Adjective? No. Noun, pronoun. Uh... Just by elimination, pronoun. So if I have pronoun. there, there is a possessive pronoun, like their clothes, their books, their wallet. So whose wallet is it? It's their wallet. That sort of. And, and then there replaces John and John and Judy lost their wallet. Their wallet was stolen. Therefore, there is a possessive pronoun that replaces John and Judy, the antecedent. You got that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, he knocked on the door. What part of speech is the underlying, uh, the underlying term? Is it a pronoun, a noun, or a verb? Um, B? Uh, technically, it's correct, but what is a more correct answer than B? A. A, yes. It is true that a pronoun is a kind of a uh, noun. But technically, he, if I want to say John knocked on the door, that would be a noun. And then something that replaces a noun, pronoun, would be he, she, they. What kind of pronoun is this? Subject or object pronoun? 
that would be right. object comes before the verb when something comes before the verb it's a subject pronoun when subject. something comes after the pronoun it's an object pronoun so he she they we that's all coming before the verb because it's this it's replacing the subject it's replacing john john knocked on the door he that's why it's known as a subject pronoun anyway leave blank keys out on the coffee table they seem to like this one uh, i think this is aimed at a certain dialect of of, of the country um yeah I'm, I'm serious there's a whole section of the country that talks like that's why they have so many of these back in, but back in the northeast you don't really hear that as much that's why back in the north like new york with new yorkers it's just their accent coffee coffee it's coffee coffee so do we say leave them keys out on the coffee table coffee table actually or leave those keys on the coffee table which is correct which is uh, the b correct? b yes so are these are those chairs theirs theirs or theirs b b do we say see once again they do so many of these this is so easy for 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 yanks them two movies or those two movies those those two movies um i remember i visited my brother in atlanta down there everyone said y'all y'all so when i came back to california to teach english and i said to my students y'all understand what i just said and they all looked at me like oh my god you just said something ungrammatical because in california instantly y'all is seen as so rustic or something whereas in atlanta it's just a, a term of speech i discovered that my car had somehow lost its 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 rear license plate so what is the correct possessive pronoun for this sentence b b the apples spoiled due to the humidity do we say they there or them to replace apples they they that's a subject pronoun okay once again, it's the same thing. What is the correct demonstrative pronoun for this sentence? Is it this? B. Here? B. Okay. And then we just did this one. The blank of the two pictures featured an owl with three eyes. Which adjective or adverb completes the sentence? B. B. Yes, because we have a comparative. So when we're, I have to explain this for the people watching the video. So it's a comparative, and that's why we use, uh, we're comparing two pictures. And then the fact that the owl has three eyes has nothing to do with it, okay? So you're comparing the two pictures. So we say stranger. So you got that right. Now, do you wanna do some more practice uh, of, of the quiz? Yes, no? It's up to I you. I think I have it. Okay, so I will skip over this. You can practice it on your own. So for the people, see now, now you can hear the, 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 can you hear the car going? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you imagine technology? It's all the way in California, you're hearing it. Where, where are you located? I'm in Tennessee. So here, there in Tennessee, you're hearing a car go off in, in California. The wonders of technology, right? Um, yes, all right. Oh, in Tennessee, you hear a lot of people say this, their car, that, them, them books. Oh, yes. And I'm actually from Texas, so I'm very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you keep saying that. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, because every time, every time I see this there, that I just think about, I just think about them constantly. Um, and I can't, I can't help it. So um, we're going to move on to something else. And to all the people who are watching this, you can do this. And then all of the answers are over here. And during, if you want a one-on-one, -on -one, with me, you can always email me. It has to be before Wednesday, of course. And that way, for instance, for next Wednesday, if you're still having trouble with the week three practice, then as part of next Wednesday's lecture, I can go over uh, this week three prep again, since it's not due until next, not this Sunday, but the Sunday after next. So for the people who are watching, if you still need more review of week three quiz, even though you watch this recording, I can go over again next week, one on one, if you email me and you can, we can do it before the uh, 4 p.m. Um, lecture. So I would be 3.30 Eastern, or you could do it after the lecture. So anyway, so getting onto this, there's 
So there's not much left. I'm just gonna go over your week two assignment. Your week two assignment has to do with the writing process. So when you write any, any paper, there are three stages. This is what I was talking about earlier. Here you have pre-writing where you write an outline of your paper. And then here you have, then that's the first stage. That's week two assignment. Then you have writing in which you transform that outline into a five paragraph essay format. That would be your week four rough draft assignment. Then you have post writing, which is rewriting. And that would be your week five and six assignment where you revise and proofread your essay. And then we have peer review and everybody uh, corrects and um, everyone's paper. So that's week five and six. And so for the first six weeks of this class, you're gonna be experiencing the writing process with essay one. But since, so week two is the very first stage in which we're doing pre-writing, in which you're trying to decide, for some people, they're not gonna do that I became a nurse because. That's the most common topic. You can do other topics like the most embarrassing um, you know, event in my life, the most important person in my life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or lessons learned. Getting somebody just wrote, getting married early, at an early age is really good. It's really good for for a person because. And then she wrote her three life lessons of why she thinks that that being married young um, made her a more mature person. Or being a mother is a very rewarding experience because her her three reasons. So you can have many different reasons. And then all you have to do for your pre-writing is just to write that outline and then to tell me what you're gonna write about. And then, and then in week four, we'll transform that outline into a rough draft. And so here is an example of your, um, of a um, worksheet, okay? And so you can either just write out the, the, the outline in classic outline format, you can, or you can hand me a mind map in which you put the center idea in the center circle, and then you put the outer ideas, your body paragraph ideas in the outer circles, and then your, your sub points of what you're gonna put in your body paragraphs in the outer circles. So you can do it either way. As long as I receive a, an outline for your paper that includes a thesis statement, three reasons, and then three sub points of those reasons, then that's fine, okay? So some people prefer to use the worksheet, and so here's an example. If you choose to use the worksheet, you would say here, the topic I chose is the following, never take somebody for granted. And so here you have a, a it's, and there are two kinds of, so a student also asked me, what, if, she, if I wanted to a story with a moral, or do I wanna write an essay with the three reasons? And I said, you can do either one. There are two kinds of, 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 essay, of narrative narratives that you can write. You can write something with a moral, such as never take somebody for granted. But I, what I did was I combined them both, okay? So you can either write about make a claim and then three reasons, that's one kind of essay, narrative essay, that's I became a nurse because, that's an expository narrative essay. Or you could just write a, a narrative story narrative essay in which you write a, um, in which you write the moral of the story, the moral of the story. So I combined it into both. And so in this example, I mesh the two kinds together and you have life lessons and reasons all together as one narrative essay. And if you're confused uh, with what I just said, I can give another example. Did, did I just say too much when I talked about two different kinds of narrative essays? Did you get that? No, Oh, okay. I did. So here you have the, the moral of this is never take somebody for granted. And then my working thesis is to avoid taking somebody for granted, one should give that loved one love, time, and appreciation. And so you can, for your um, parallel structure, for your thesis statement, you can have, did I just do that? Okay. You can have adjective, adjective, and adjective for your thesis statement, for your three reasons. You don't have to have sentence, sentence, sentence. And of course, the most common one is sentence, sentence, and sentence. In other words, I became a nurse because I love people, I get along with people, and I want a job with steady um, benefits. Here you would have semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. 
And then when you write that all with the semicolon, that makes it one sentence, one thesis statement, and makes it with parallel structure. You don't mix and match. You don't say, um, to avoid taking a loved one for granted, one should give love, one should have nice time and appreciate. You don't, you don't mix and match. Either adjective, 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 or sentence, 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 and then this becomes parallel structure. Okay, we don't mix, we don't mix and match. Uh, that is also a common, common mistake. Or you can say adjective, noun, adjective, noun, and adjective, uh, adjective, noun. Um, Martin Luther King was a great activist because he was a smart priest. Uh, he was a smart minister an educated college man, and a very active activist. So here I had adjective, noun, college man, adjec uh, what did it say, educated man. And so here you have adjective, noun, adjective, noun, adjective, noun. So you can have your three reasons. There's so many combinations for parallel structure. I'm not even, that's a different lecture. So I'm just going to give you three examples. And in this one, it's love, time, and appreciation. And so that becomes your body paragraph, love, time, and appreciation. If you're gonna write about your life lessons, life lesson one, life lesson two, I learned um, by, by dr almost drowning in a pool, I learned the three, these three life lessons. I learned to appreciate life. I learned to love my, you know, hug my loved ones tightly. And I learned to appreciate the world, whatever. Sentence, sentence, sentence. So you can have, for your thesis statement, you just have to make sure you include your three reasons, three adjectives that become your body paragraphs. Then here, um, one never knows, describe the main point or moral of your narrative. And that's the same as a thesis statement. One never knows how long anybody will live. Therefore, one should never take a uh, loved one for granted. To avoid taking one, I just, this is the same thing as your thesis statement. Then you're gonna write one paragraph on how you're gonna show love, and then how you're gonna show appreciation, and how you're gonna show them time. So these same three reasons become uh, paragraph two, paragraph three, paragraph four, and you're gonna write five sentences. This is where you write your, your stories, okay? If you're wondering, but, but this is a narrative. And so yes, you can write a narrative story about how you show love to a loved one. So I could say, I showed love to my mother, or my mother showed love to me when I was a little girl. She used to, um, we didn't have seat belts back then because it hadn't been invented yet. So if you were a small child in a car, my mother would hold me in her arms as I would fall asleep. Um, I actually prefer that better than seat belts because then the parents are forced to hold you to keep you from bouncing around the car. But anyway, so that would be, uh, I show, she showed me love, but I showed her love was when she got old and I had to take care of her in return because she forgot everything. And I had to remind her how to, you know, I had to do everything. I was like a caregiver for her. So I showed her love and then uh, I, I give them time, which means that um, I had to give up a lot of time in my life in order to take care of her and then appreciate all they did for me. Then that would be a story from your childhood. When I was young, my mother gave up, I guess, she, she, she went back to school. She was going to get a BA and in um, accounting. Normally, it takes someone four years to get a BA in accounting. It took my mother 10 years to get her BA in accounting because she was taking care of me, my brother, and a few cousins. And so, um, so it took her longer to go up her career path because, and I remember I was stupid enough to ask my mother, I was little, I said, well, if a BA takes only four years for everybody else, why did it take you 10 years, mommy? I got spanked for saying something that stupid. But anyway, um, so I show them my appreciation for all they do for me. So this would be, um, you list your, your sub, sub, sub reasons, your sub, sub points. Why did you choose this subject? My mother died this past March and I learned the hard lesson that I had taken her for granted. So I am teaching others how not to take my lo your loved one for granted. Um, and then here you can, all of these questions that you answer, then when you write your thesis statement in your rough draft, then you, when you write, you, after you write your, your introduction paragraph, your introduction paragraph is gonna have your hook, your five sentence origin story, and then your thesis statement. And so these questions, when you do your week four rough draft, 
the answers to these questions you can use before your rough before your thesis statement when you write your intro. In other words, why is this thesis statement so important? And so the answer to these questions can be part of your origin story that you put in your introduction paragraph. Because you remember that your thesis statement is going to be the last sentence. So therefore, you got to have some stuff on top. And this could be the stuff that goes on top. Now, when you do your step three, then you have all of these different choices of, of pre writing. Free writing means that you just write out whatever comes through your head. Mapping and clustering means that you draw a circle and then you put the main idea in the main circle. You put the body paragraph topic sentences in the outer circles. And that I, I mentioned this earlier. And then you put your reasons for the reasons in the outer circles. Brain lit, brainstorming is you same thing as free writing. You just write down a list of different lists, just whatever thoughts come to your head about what you're going to write. It's, you don't think about grammar, you just write about everything that comes through your head. And then questioning means that there's also listing. I don't know why that's not there. Questioning and listing are the same thing, in which you write down a list of questions or a list of things that you know about the topic that you want to write about. So this helps you come up with reasons uh, for your essay. This becomes much more important when we do the essay two comparison contrast essay. So these, you get to choose for step three, you get to choose which kind of pre-writing exercise you want to do, okay? So here, if I did questioning, what can you do to show love to your loved one? What can you do to show more appreciation? In other words, you ask yourself questions, and then the answer to those questions become your body paragraphs, okay? So here I did, I chose free writing, okay? In which I just free wrote what I was thinking, and here, this actually actually happened um, a year ago. I remember the first time I taught this, I actually cried. It's getting easier now um, as time goes by. I still can, I still don't, I pref still prefer to think of my mother, remember her young, and not remember her with a tube, tube down her throat. Um, it turned out later, she died of COVID uh, complications. We, did, we didn't know that at the time. Um, but the telltale sign was she died very quickly. She had an underlying condition and uh, she couldn't eat or breathe at the, at the end. But anyway, so this is free writing where you just write. And also you can use dialogue. Okay, so here, there is nothing more I can do for you. Say your piece. This is a doctor talking. There's nothing more I can do for you. Say your piece. She will not last more than an hour without the ventilator. My father approached the bed and softly touched my mother's cheek. I had never seen my mother look, my father look so devastated. My mother's face was filled with fear as she knew that she was, as death was nearing. I should have put that in there. I said to my mother, I love you. I'm sorry for all the times I said I was too busy to talk to you on the phone. She, please forgive me. And then her eyes, she couldn't speak, but her eyes forgave me. Um, her last words before, um, when they took it out, when they took out the um, ventilator, uh, not the ventilator, that's what it's called. Yeah, they took out the ventilator and she was able to say, I am so proud of you. I love you. Um, say hello to, uh, that's my Robert for me. That, those were her, that, that's uh, my partner. She never finished the sentence after that. And then she, she just died and she died, she died peacefully. They, they gave her morphine to calm her down. So to avoid taking your loved one. So this is the introduction paragraph in case you're wondering. So to avoid taking your loved one for granted, one should never, uh, one should give love, appreciation, and time to your loved one while they are on earth. Because here I made a mistake. You never say you because one never knows how long they have on earth. So always replace all your you, unless it's in a, unless the you is inside a, um, a dialogue, you can use you, but you cannot say you outside of a, a dialogue. You have to replace it with a person, a person's, or one, because that sounds more professional. Okay, so this is, um, this was, so you can use dialogue to, to move your story along. It's actually on your rubric that worth 10 points that you have to in, insert some kind of dialogue into your story anyway. So here I put the dialogue here, and that was the actual dialogue that I gave, gave to my mother. Um, that was last March, right before everybody said it was COVID. She died right before then. And then the most common topic students are going to write about is, I became a nurse because, 
reason one, reason two, reason three, and reason one goes to paragraph two, reason two goes to paragraph two, reason three goes to paragraph four. When your body paragraphs match the thesis, this is called the five paragraph essay structure. Your narrative essay needs to follow the structure to have uh, essay coherence. So if you're gonna choose this topic of why you went back to nursing school or why you became a nurse, and you can't think of what reasons, that's, that's why we do free writing so that you could think of free write any thought in your head to come up with reasons. And then I helped you along by these were the most common reasons that other students wrote when they wrote this topic. I wanna to be a role model for my children, steady benefits, heal people, caring for people, high job satisfaction, building relationships with people, switching jobs, travel the world. In this class so far, it's travel the world, um, be in high demand, plenty of opportunities, flexible schedule, steady career, caring person. So if you choose this topic, this is known as listing, where you list all the different reasons that come to your head. Then when you write your actual um, thesis statement, all you choose is the, the most, the three most important ones. And that becomes your essay. You don't have to write about all of this. So this is known as listing when you list everything. So you can choose three of these if you're gonna choose a, I want to become a um, nurse because here are some other um, uh, topics you can write about. A major turning point in my life was I started the Fortis program because the role model in my life is, in my case, my mother. I became a teacher because, and the major life lessons in my life are, in other words, the three most important life lessons that you've, that you've learned in your life so far is be kind, be humble, be curious. That I got off a commercial, but anyway, um, it was for, for Norwegian, Norwegian Airlines, or Norwegian Cruise. Anyway, so here you have be kind, be gentle, be curious. Then you can write a paragraph on being kind, a paragraph on being curious, and so on and so forth. Um, the happiest day of my life, going back to school, the most embarrassing moment of my life. So those are other topics that you can write about. And then if you have any other topic, like getting married young, uh, raising kids, uh, then those are, that's fine also. I'll add that to, to this list for future classes. And so I already went over this. Week two is pre-writing. Week four is writing, where you're gonna convert into a draft because those are the three steps of the writing process. And then the last step, so pre-writing, writing, rewriting writing are the three uh, steps of the writing process that you're gonna experience weeks one through six. Do you have any questions about your week two assignment? No, ma'am. Good. For the week three forum, you're gonna be adding description. In other words, you're gonna practice using descriptive language. And so I already have somebody, I think who posted something, she wrote a really good one. But basically what you're going to do is you're gonna have people, you're gonna describe a food and then you're not gonna tell people what that food is. We have to guess from your description what that food is. In this way, you appeal to all five senses and in this way, you practice using descriptive language. And so here is an example. I have a warm crust. On my crust are tomato sauce, cheese, and many toppings, such as pepperoni, anchovies, and meat. I come in many styles, such as New York, California, Hawaiian style. In Hawaii, they put pineapples on my crust. People love to eat me at, at football games, especially during the Super Bowl, where I am quite popular and delicious. I come from Italy originally. What food am I? And that's going to be your initial post due before Wednesday of week three. In other words, before Wednesday of next week. So you don't have to worry about this this week. All you have to do for this week is just your outline. So you don't have to go ahead. Otherwise, you're going to have nobody post to you for like a week, okay, if you do it this week. <coughs> so then once you post your initial post of this, <coughs> you're going to try to guess You're going to try to guess other people's post. So other people's posts, are you a hot dog? Are you a hamburger? <clears throat> yeah, I know, my, my, my voice went away. Are you a pizza? And so here you're going to guess other people. And if somebody guesses yours correctly, let's say someone says, is it a pizza? You're going to say, yes, that's correct, Angela. 
and stuff like that. <clears throat> and if someone guesses close, you give them more hints. That's basically, that's it. So it's a food game. And so that's what you're gonna do for the week three, <coughs> for the week three forum. So that would be pretty much, I am long and thin like a pencil. I am made of beef. I come between two buns. In New York, people often put sauerkraut on me. Some, some put relish, mustard, or ketchup on me. Nathan's makes a delicious version of me. Oscar Mayer does too. People eat me when they go to baseball games. I do not bark. I am much more popular than McDonald's Quarter Pounder. Some call me junk food. What food am I? Which one is it? Which do you think? Uh, hot dog. Hot ah, dog, yes. So yes, that's correct, Thelma. So here you get the idea. This is a fun game and you're gonna have fun and you're going to then um, smell, sight, taste, hearing, and touch. And then you want the reader to experience what you describe. And this is the essence of descriptive language. Now the rest of this lecture, will just go over the different parts of a paragraph, which has a topic sentence, supporting sentence, and supporting sentences. And it's gonna go over the different parts of your introduction paragraph, your conclusion paragraph. So your introduction has a hook, which grabs the reader's attention. Background information, that's your, or, your five sentence origin story where you're gonna place five sentences of why this topic is important. And then your very last sentence, when you, this is for week four, when you do your rough draft and you turn everything into a paragraph, this will be for your week four rough draft. And then, you're, and then the reason why it's an upside down triangle is as it gets farther and farther down, it becomes more, the information becomes more and more important and becomes from general to specific. When you write your summary conclusion paragraph, you write your thesis statement as the first sentence of the last paragraph, then you summarize the paper and everything becomes less and less important. So it's the opposite. So when you write your week four rough draft, you can, um, this could be your, uh, this will be your introduction and your conclusion paragraph. And your body paragraphs simply have to match your thesis statement, which is what I had the example. And I believe that's it. So I, I cut this really, really short. And I don't know if I went to, and then for people who are watching on video, I'm gonna to have to tell them to go 12 minutes in because it took us 12 minutes for me to realize that this screen wasn't showing. Um, about 12 minutes, right? Because I looked at the clock and I said, okay, two, uh, 112, therefore that's 112 my time. So that means if people wait 12 minutes, um, I'm gonna to have to play this in 12 minutes in to see what the numbers are. And that would be when this lecture actually really starts, it's 12 minutes in, I think. So yeah, so, so everybody who's watching this video, um, you have to be patient because eventually I do get to, I'll, I'll write that in the, in the whatchamacallit, 12 minutes in, and that's when this video actually starts. And that's it. You're not gonna get that, that's just for, so do you have any questions? And if you are ready, you could probably take the quiz right now because you scored 100% on your practice quiz. And so for each person, you should also practice, watch this. And also I have a week three quiz video on my homepage and I have the week three quiz PowerPoint on the homepage. Those are read only, you can't download it. And I will download a uh, hard copy if you add, I think I already downloaded a hard copy off the top of my head. If not, I will be doing it after this lecture. It's a, it's a look, so go, go to your email and I will download a copy of this lecture. And I think I might have already done so. And I will also uh, download a copy of the PowerPoint that, that you see that's only readable online. Um, and then you got to study all of this, get it 100% on your practice quiz. Then you take your actual quiz and then you get a really good grade. And that about sums up this week's, um, let me see, uh, stop share. Yeah, that about sums up this week's um, lecture. And I hope that, uh, um, and so as I was saying, I hope everybody just watches this 12 minutes in because right after I, I give my speech, in the very beginning, I give this speech, that's fine. 
Then you got to wait 12 minutes before finally, oh, she finally realizes she's not visible. Brittany, if you hadn't told me that you couldn't see it, I would have gone this entire uh, lecture without realizing that you weren't seeing. So, you know, so that means that one thing I've got to tell my, because I'm mentoring a junior faculty, always ask if people can see what you're sharing. Whenever I, I go to someone else's webinar, the first thing people ask, the, the host would ask, can you hear me? Can you see my file? Have you ever gone to someone else's Zoom and they ask that at first? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so now I gotta, I gotta do the same. Otherwise you're gonna give your, I, I remember one time I attended a webinar and we, we just sat there and he, he didn't realize we weren't looking at his, his PowerPoint until he started asking questions, just like I did. And he goes, John, what do you think of uh, such and such a PowerPoint slide? And finally, somebody said, well, you see, we haven't been able to see your PowerPoint for the past 10 minutes. Ah, the host all freaked. That was really funny, the, the freak out look on, her, on, his, on his face. He had to start <laughs> over. So I just made the same mistake. We were sitting there going, I wonder when he's gonna realize his PowerPoint's not showing. Another, another time it was, I wonder when he's gonna realize we can't hear him. That was another, that was a different, in a different one. We just sat there. When is he going to ask us, can you hear me? Because you're supposed to ask that in the beginning. So anyway, I made the same mistake as those freaked out hosts as well, because I assumed everybody could see everything. So um, anyway, um, so when you give a presentation, that's a good, a good point. When you give an oral presentation, Zoom or a webinar, you always have to ask, and this is something I'm learning now, can you hear me? Can you see the file I'm sharing? First, before you start rambling on, that's a lesson learned. See, life lesson learned. I can actually write an essay about this. Um, three lessons I learned from today's lecture. Yeah. Anyway, um, if you have no more questions, um, I can end this lecture. And do um, you have any other questions? No, ma'am. Okay, then I'll see you hopefully next week. I don't think I'm doing a quiz prep lecture. Next week, I think is uh, writing for nurses. I think that's next week's topic off the top of my head. So academic writing for nurses, I think is week three. Yeah. So if you want to know what it's like to write, I believe that's what it is off the top of my head. I have to look at my chart. to. to but anyway, I hope to see you next week. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. See you next week. Thank you. You're welcome.